Books may be written in all sorts of places. Verbal inspiration may enter the berth of a mariner on board a ship frozen fast in a river in the middle of a town. And since saints are supposed to look benignantly on humble believers, I indulge in the pleasant fancy that the shade of old Flaubert, who imagined himself to be, among other things, a descendant of Vikings, might have hovered with amused interest over the docks of a 2,000-ton steamer called the Adoa, on board of which, gripped by the inclement winter, alongside a quay in Rouen, the tenth chapter of Almayer's Folly was begun. With interest, I say, for was not the kind Norman giant with enormous mustaches and a thundering voice the last of the romantics? Was he not, in his unworldly, almost ascetic devotion to his art, a sort of literary saint-like hermit? It has said at last, said Nina to her mother, pointing to the hills behind which the sun had sunk. These words of Almere's romantic daughter I remember tracing on the gray paper of a pad which rested on the blanket of my bedplace. They referred to a sunset in Malayan Isles and shaped themselves in my mind in a hallucinated vision of forests and rivers and seas, far removed from a commercial and yet romantic town of the northern hemisphere. But at that moment, the mood of visions and words was cut short by the third officer, a cheerful and casual youth, coming in with a bang of the door and the exclamation, You've made it a jolly warm in here. It was warm. I had turned on the steam heater after placing a tin under the leaky water cock. Perhaps you did not know that water will leak where steam will not. I am not aware of what my young friend had been doing on deck all that morning, but the hands he rubbed together vigorously were very red and imparted to me a chilly feeling by their mere aspect. He has remained the only banjoist of my acquaintance, and being also a younger son of a retired colonel, the poem of Mr. Kipling, by a strange aberration of associated ideas, always seems to me to have been written with an exclusive view of his person. When he did not play the banjo, he loved to sit and look at it. He proceeded to this sentimental inspection, and after meditating a while over the strings under my silent scrutiny, inquired airily, What are you always scribbling there, if it's fair to ask? It was a fair enough question. But I did not answer him, and simply turned the pad over with a movement of instinctive secrecy. I could not have told him he had put to flight the psychology of Nina Almayer, her opening speech of the tenth chapter, and the words of Mrs. Almayer's wisdom which were to follow in the ominous oncoming of a tropical night. I could not have told him that Nina had said, It has set at last. He would have been extremely surprised, and perhaps dropped his precious banjo. Neither could I have told him that the sun of my sea-going was setting too, even as I wrote the words expressing the impatience of passionate youth bent on its desire. I did not know this myself, and it is safe to say he would not have cared, though he was an excellent young man and treated me with more deference than, in our relative positions, I was strictly entitled to. He lowered a tender gaze on his banjo, and I went on looking through the porthole, the round opening framed in its brass rim in a fragment of the quays, with a row of casks ranged on the frozen ground and the tail end of a great cart, a red-nosed carter on a blouse and a woolen nightcap leaned against the wheel. An idle, strolling custom house guard belted over his blue capote had the air of being depressed by exposure to the weather and the monotony of official existence. The background of grimy houses found a place in the picture framed by my porthole. Across a wide stretch of paved quay, brown with frozen mud, 
The coloring was somber, and the most conspicuous feature was a little cafe with curtained windows and a shabby front of white woodwork corresponding with the squalor of these poorer quarters bordering the river. We had been shifted down there from another berth in the neighborhood of the opera house, where the same porthole gave me a view of another sort of cafe, the best in the town. I believe in the very one where the worthy Bovary and his wife, the romantic daughter of old Pere Renault, had some refreshment after the memorable performance of an opera which was the tragic story of Lucia di Lammermoor in a setting of light music. I could recall no more the hallucination of the eastern archipelago, which I certainly hope to see again. The story of Almeyer's folly got put away under the pillow for that day. I do not know that I had my occupation to keep me away from it. The truth of the matter is that on board that ship we were leading just then a contemplative life. I will not say anything of my privileged position. I was there just to oblige, as an actor standing may take a small part in the performance of a friend. As far as my feelings were concerned, I did not wish to be in that steamer at that time and in those circumstances and perhaps I was not even wanted there in the usual sense in which a ship wants an officer. It was the first and last instance in my sea life when I served ship owners who have remained completely shadowy to my apprehension. I do not mean this for the well-known firm of London ship brokers which had chartered the ship to the, I will not say short-lived, but ephemeral Franco-Canadian Transport Company. A death leaves something behind, but there was never anything tangible left from the FCTC. It flourished no longer than roses live, and unlike the roses, it blossomed in the dead of winter, emitted a sort of faint perfume of adventure, and died before spring set in. But indubitably, it was a company, it had even a house flag, all white with the letters FCTC, artfully tangled up in a complicated monogram. We flew it at our main mast head, and now I have come to the conclusion that it was the only flag of its kind in existence. All the same, we on board for many days had the impression of being a unit of large fleet with fortnightly departures, for Montreal and Quebec, as advertised in pamphlets and prospectuses, which came aboard in a large package in Victoria Dock, London, just before we started for Rouen, France. And in the shadowy life of the FCTC lies the secret of that, my last employment and my calling, which in a remote sense interrupted the rhythmical development of Nina Almayer's story. The then secretary of the London Shipmasters Society, with its modest rooms in Fenchurch Street, was a man of indefatigable activity and the greatest devotion to his task. He is responsible for what was my last association with a ship. I call it that because it can hardly be called a seagoing experience. Dear Captain Froud, it is impossible not to pay him the tribute of affectionate familiarity at this distance of years, had very sound views as to the advancement and knowledge and the status of the very whole body of officers of the mercantile marine. He organized for us courses of professional lectures, St. John ambulance classes, corresponded industriously with public bodies and member of parliament on subjects touching the interests of the service and as to the oncoming of some inquiry or commission relating to the matters of the sea and to the work of seamen. It was a perfect godsend to his need of exerting himself on our corporate behalf. Together with his high sense of his official duties, he had in him a vein of personal kindness a strong disposition to do 
what good he could to the individual members of that craft of which, in his time, he had been a very excellent master. And what greater kindness can one do to a seaman than to put him in the way of employment? Captain Froude did not see why the Shipmaster's Society, besides its general guardianship of our interests, should not be unofficially an employment agency of the very highest class. I am trying to persuade all our great ship-owning firms to come to us for their men. There is nothing of a trade union spirit about our society, and I really don't see why they should not, he said once to me. I am always willing to tell the captains, too, that, all things being equal, they ought to give preference to the members of the society. In my position, I generally find for them what they want among our members or our associate members. In my wanderings about London from west to east and back again, I was very idle then, the two little rooms in Finch Church Street were a sort of resting place where my spirit, hankering after the sea, could feel itself nearer to the ships, the men, and the life of its choice, nearer there than on any other spot of the solid earth. This resting place used to be at about five o'clock in the afternoon, full of men and tobacco smoke. But Captain Froude had the smaller room to himself, and there he granted private interviews, whose principal motive was to render service. Thus, one murky November afternoon, he beckoned me in with a crooked finger, and that peculiar glance above his spectacles, which is perhaps my strongest physical recollection of the man. I have had in here a shipmaster this morning, he said, getting back to his desk and motioning me to a chair, who is in want of an officer. It's for a steamship. You know, nothing pleases me more than to be asked, but unfortunately I do not quite see my way. As the other room was full of men, I cast a wondering glance at the closed door, but he shook his head. Oh, yes. I should be only too glad to get the berth for one of them. But the fact of the matter is, the captain of that ship wants an officer who can speak French fluently, and that's not so easy to find. I do not know anybody myself but you. It's a second officer's berth, and of course you would not care, would you now? I know that it isn't what you are looking for. It was not. I had given myself up to the idleness of a haunted man who looks for nothing but words wherein to capture his visions. But I admit that outwardly I resembled sufficiently a man who could make a second officer for a steamer chartered by a French company. I showed no sign of being haunted by the fate of Nina and by the murmurs of tropical forests and even my intimate intercourse with Almayer, a person of weak character, had not put a visible mark upon my features. For many years he and the world of his story had been the companions of my imagination, without, I hope, impairing my ability to deal with the realities of sea life. I had had the man and his surroundings with me ever since my return from the eastern waters some four years before the day of which I speak. It was in the front sitting-room of furnished apartments in a Pimlico square that they first began to live again with a vividness and poignancy quite foreign to our former real intercourse. I had been treating myself to a long stay on shore, and in the necessity of occupying my mornings, Almayer, that old acquaintance, came nobly to the rescue. Before long, as was only proper, his wife and daughter joined him round my table, and then the rest of that pante band came full of words and gestures. Unknown to my respectable landlady, it was my practice directly after my breakfast to hold animated receptions of Malays, Arabs, and half-castes. They did not clamor aloud for my attention, they came with a silent and irresistible appeal, and the appeal I affirm here was not to my self-love or my vanity, 
It seems now to have had a moral character, for why should the memory of these beings, seen in their obscure sun-bathed existence, demand to express itself in the shape of a novel, except on the ground of that mysterious fellowship which unites in a community of hopes and fears all the dwellers on this earth? I did not receive my visitors with a boisterous rapture as the bearer of any gifts of profit or fame. There was no vision of a printed book before me as I sat writing at that table, situated in a decayed part of Belgravia. After all these years, each leaving its evidence of slowly blackened pages, I can honestly say that it is a sentiment akin to pity which prompted me to render in words assembled with conscientious care the memory of things far distant and of men who had lived. But coming back to Captain Froude and his fixed idea of never disappointing ship owners or ship captains, it was not likely that I should fail him in his ambition to satisfy at a few hours notice the unusual demand for a French-speaking officer. He explained to me that the ship was chartered by a French company intended to establish a regular monthly line of sailings from Rouen for the transport of French emigrants to Canada. But frankly, this sort of thing did not interest me very much. I said gravely that if it were really a matter of keeping up the reputation of the shipmaster society, I would consider it. But the consideration was just for form's sake. The next day I interviewed the captain, and I believe we were impressed favorably with each other. He explained that his chief mate was an excellent man in every respect, and that he could not think of dismissing him so as to give me the higher position but that if I consented to come as second officer, I would be given certain special advantages, and so on. I told him that if I came at all, the rank really didn't matter. I'm sure, he insisted, you'll get on first rate with Mr. Paramore. I promised faithfully to stay for two trips at least, and it was in those circumstances that what was to be my last connection with the ship began, and after all, there was not even one single trip. It may be that it was simply the fulfillment of a fate, of that written word on my forehead, which apparently forbade me, through all my sea wanderings, ever to achieve the crossing of the Western Ocean, using the words in that special sense in which sailors speak of Western Ocean trade, of Western Ocean packets, of western ocean hard cases. The new life attended closely upon the old, and the nine chapters of Almayer's Folly went with me to the Victoria Dock, whence in a few days we started for Rouen. I won't go so far as saying that the engaging of a man fated never to cross the western ocean was the absolute cause of the franco-canadian transport company's failure to achieve even a single passage it might have been that of course but the obvious gross obstacle was clearly the want of money four hundred and sixty bunks for emigrants were put together in the tween decks by industrious carpenters while we lay in the victoria dock but never an immigrant turned up in rouen of which, being a humane person, I confess I was glad. Some gentlemen from Paris, I think there were three of them, and one said to be the chairman, turned up, indeed, and went from end to end of the ship, knocking their silk hats cruelly against the deck beams. I attended them personally, and I can vouch for it that the interest they took in things was intelligent enough, though obviously they had never seen anything of the sort before. Their faces, as they went ashore, wore a cheerfully inconclusive expression, notwithstanding that this inspecting ceremony was supposed to be a preliminary to immediate sailing. It was then, as they filed down our gangway, that I received the inward monition that no sailing within the meaning of our charter party would ever take place. It must be said that in less than three weeks a move took place. 
When we first arrived, we had been taken up with much ceremony, well toward the center of the town, and all the street corners being placarded with tricolor posters announcing the birth of our company. The petit bourgeois with his wife and family made a Sunday holiday from the inspection of the ship. I was always in evidence in my best uniform to give information as though I had been a cook's tourist's interpreter, while our quartermasters reaped a harvest of small change from personal conducted parties. But when the move was made, that move which carried us some mile and a half down the stream to be tied up to an altogether muddier and shabbier quay, then indeed the desolation of solitude became our lot. It was a complete and soundless stagnation, for as we had the ship ready for sea to the smallest detail, as the frost was hard and the day short, we were absolutely idle, idle to the point of blushing with shame when the thought struck us that all the time our salaries went on. Young Cole was aggrieved because, as he said, we could not enjoy any sort of fun in the evening after loafing like this all day. Even the banjo lost its charm since there was nothing to prevent his strumming on it all the time between the meals. The good paramour, he was really a most excellent fellow, became unhappy as far as was possible to his cheery nature. Till one dreary day I suggested, out of sheer mischief, that he should employ the dormant energies of the crew in hauling both cables up on deck and turning them end for end. For a moment, Mr. Paramore was radiant. Excellent idea, but directly his face fell. Well, I guess, but we can't make that job last more than three days, he muttered discontentedly. I don't know how long he expected us to be stuck on the riverside outskirts of Rouen, but I know that the cables got hauled up and turned end for end according to my satanic suggestion, put down again and their very existence utterly forgotten. I believe before our French river pilot came on board to take our ship down, empty as she came in, into the Havre roads. You may think that this state of forced idleness favored some advance in the fortunes of Almayer and his daughter, yet it was not so. As if it were some sort of evil spell, my banjoist cabin mate's interruption, as related above, had arrested them in short at the point of that fateful sunset for many weeks together. It was always thus with this book, begun in 1889 and finished in 1894, with that shortest of all the novels which it was to be my lot to write. Between its opening exclamation, calling Almer to his dinner in his wife's voice and Abdullah's, his enemy, mental reference to the God of Islam, the merciful, the compassionate, which closes the book, there were to come several long sea passages, a visit, to use the elevated phraseology suitable to the occasion, to the scenes, some of them, of my childhood, and the realization of childhood's vain words expressing a light-hearted and romantic whim. It was in 1686, when nine years old or thereabouts, that while looking at a map of Africa of the time, and putting my finger on the blank space, then representing the unsolved mystery of that continent, I said to myself with absolute assurance and an amazing audacity, which are no longer in my character now, when I grow up I shall go there. And of course, I thought no more about it till after a quarter of a century or so an opportunity offered to go there, as if the sin of childish audacity were to be visited on my mature head. Yes, I did go there, there being the region of Stanley Falls, which in 1868 was the blankest of blank spaces on the Earth's figured surface, and the M.S. of Almayer's folly carried about me as if it were a talisman or a treasure, went there too. That it ever came out of there seems a special dispensation of providence, because a good many of my other properties 
infinitely more valuable and useful to me, remain behind through unfortunate accidents of transportation. I call to mind, for instance, a specially awkward turn of the Congo between Kinshasa and Leopoldsville, more particularly when one had to take it at night in a big canoe with only half the proper number of paddlers. I failed in being the second white man on record drowned at that interesting spot through the upsetting of a canoe. The first was a young Belgian officer, but the accident happened some months before my time, and he too, I believe, was going home. Not perhaps quite so ill as myself, but still he was going home. I got round the turn more or less alive, though I was too sick to care whether I did or not, and always with Almayer's folly among my diminishing baggage. I arrived at that delectable capital, Boma, where, before the departure of the steamer which was to take me home, I had the time to wish myself dead over and over again with perfect sincerity. At that date, there were in existence only seven chapters of Almayer's folly, but the chapter in my history, which followed, was that of a long, long illness and very dismal convalescence. Geneva, or more precisely the hydropathic establishment of Champel, is rendered forever famous by the termination of the eighth chapter in the history of Almayer's decline and fall. The events of the ninth are inextricably mixed up with the details of the proper management of a waterside warehouse owned by a certain city firm whose name does not matter. But that work, undertaken to accustom myself again to the activities of a healthy exercise, soon came to an end. The earth had nothing to hold me with for very long. And then that memorable story like a cask of choice Madeira got carried for three years to and fro upon the sea. Whether this treatment improved its flavor or not, of course, I would not like to say. As far as appearance is concerned, it certainly did nothing of the kind. The whole MS, the manuscript, acquired a faded look and an ancient yellowish complexion. It became at last unreasonable to suppose that anything in the world would ever happen to Almayer and Nina and yet something most unlikely to happen on the high seas was to wake them up from their state of suspended animation. What is it that Novalis says? It is certain my conviction gains infinitely the moment another soul will believe in it. And what it is, a novel, if not a conviction, of our fellow men's existence strong enough to take upon itself a form of imagined life clearer than reality, and, and whose accumulated verisimilitude of selected episodes puts to shame the pride of documentary history. Providence, which saved my manuscript from the Congo Rapids, brought it to the knowledge of a helpful soul far out on the open sea. It would be on my part the greatest ingratitude ever to forget the sallow, sunken face and the deep-set, dark eyes of the young Cambridge man. He was a passenger for his health on board the good ship Torrens, outward bound to Australia, who was the first reader of Almayer's Folly, the very first reader I ever had. Would it bore you very much in reading a manuscript in a handwriting like mine? I asked him one evening on a sudden impulse at the end of a longish conversation whose subject was Gibbon's history. Chalkus, that was his name, was sitting in my cabin one stormy dog watch below after bringing me a book to read from his own traveling store. Not at all, he answered with his courteous intonation and a faint smile. As I pulled the drawer open, his suddenly aroused curiosity gave him a watchful expression. I wonder what he expected to see. A poem, maybe. All that is beyond guessing now. He was not a cold, but a calm man, still more subdued by disease, a man of few words, and of an unassuming modesty in general intercourse, but with something uncommon in the whole of his person which set him apart from the undistinguished lot of our sixty passengers. His eyes had a thoughtful, introspective look, 
in his attractive reserved manner and in a veiled sympathetic voice he asked what is this it is a sort of tale i answered with an effort it is not even finished yet nevertheless i would like to know what you think of it he put the manuscript ripped in the breast pocket of his jacket i remember perfectly his thin brown fingers folding it lengthwise i will read it tomorrow he remarked seizing the door handle and then watching the roll of the ship for a perpetuous moment he opened the door and was gone in the moment of his exit i heard the sustained booming of the wind the swish of the water on the decks of the torrents and the subdued as if distant roar of the rising sea i noted the growing disquiet and the great restlessness of the ocean and responded professionally to it with the thought that at eight o'clock in another half hour or so at farthest the top gallant sails would have to come off the ship next day but this time in the first dog watch jockus entered my cabin he had a thick woolen muffler around his throat and the manuscript was in his hand he tendered it to me with a steady look but without a word i took it in silence he sat down on the couch and still said nothing i opened and shut a drawer under my desk on which a filled up log slate lay wide open in its wooden frame waiting to be copied neatly into the sort of book i was accustomed to write with care the ship's log book i turned my back squarely on the desk and even then jockus never offered a word well what do you say i asked at last is it worth finishing this question expressed exactly the whole of my thoughts distinctly he answered in his sedate veiled voice and then coughed a little were you interested i inquired further almost in a whisper very much in a pause i went on meeting instinctively the heavy rolling of the ship and jockus put his feet upon the couch the curtain of my bed place swung to and fro as if it were a punka the bulkhead lamp circled in its gimbals and now and then the cabin door rattled slightly in the gusts of wind it was in latitude forty south and nearly in the longitude of greenwich as far as i can remember that these quiet rites of al mayer's and nina's resurrection were taking place in the prolonged silence it occurred to me that there was a good deal of retrospective writing in the story as far as it went was it intelligible in its action i asked myself as if already the storyteller were being born into the body of a seaman but i heard on deck the whistle of the officer of the watch and remained on the alert to catch the order that was to follow this call to attention it reached me as a faint fierce shout to square the yards aha i thought to myself a westerly blow coming on then i turned to my first reader who alas was not to live long enough to know the end of the tale now let me ask you one more thing is the story quite clear to you as it stands he raised his dark gentle eyes to my face and seemed surprised yes perfectly this was all i was to hear from his lips concerning the merits of almayer's folly we never spoke together of the book again a long period of bad weather set in and i had no thoughts left but for my duties while poor jockus caught a fatal cold and had to keep close in his cabin when we arrived in adelaide the first reader of my prose went at once up country and died rather suddenly in the end either in australia or it may be on the passage while going home through the suez canal i am not sure which it was now and i do not think i ever heard precisely though i made inquiries about him from some of our return passengers who wandering about to see the country during the ship's stay in port had come upon him here and there at last we sailed homeward bound and still not one line was added to the careless scrawl of the many pages which poor jockus had had the patience to read 
with the very shadows of eternity gathering already and the hollows of his kind, steadfast eyes.